Hey, 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 all you happy lost souls. How's everybody doing? Um, if you're new to the channel, it's pretty much just um, a channel about my personal interests, and if you find them interesting as well, then please subscribe. Um, so the channel started up as a, a music channel for all my original tunes. I was playing places a lot when I was younger, um, in my later 20s. Um, I still do some music. Um, the pandemic kind of a uh, got in the way of playing at a lot of places live. Um, at the time, um, about 10 years, 10 years back when I started the channel, it was all music. I had very, very little subscribers, um, maybe 20 or 30, um, unknown music. Um, but then I started posting, uh, videos about my other hobby, which is, um, artifact hunting, um, which now has become rough gem hunting. Uh, and, the fascinating thing about all these artifacts that you see here, um, playing out all these ancient stone tools, um, they're all found in southeastern Pennsylvania, about 10 to 17 miles outside of Philly, some uh, areas closer. Um, these tributaries uh, link to the Delaware and um, Schuylkill watershed systems, um, all tidal water, um, all alluvial finds, um, except for... Um, a couple finds in areas where there was permission granted and um, you find stuff like this when you field walk you find a, a more woodland period or paleo woodland uh, a couple thousand years old um, not super old and you find stuff that's ancient underneath that burn layer um, that looks like a more you know you get these you know in this material here you can see the the spiraling from the percussion instrument that fractured this. But this is a greenish obsidian, um, which I believe was used a lot by the Mayans in, um, in South America by certain clans. It was a, a worshipped uh, stone green obsidian, but it makes for great tools. But this tool design is very reminiscent of Denisovan or Neanderthal, so probably 60 to 100,000 years ago. In the same area, I found that. I found these fossilized bones a fossilized bird head, fossilized fish, um, a spear point that has calcification on it, but it was fluted, and it was also, it had a, a tail on the bottom or a stem, and I call that a, um, a tooth stem. It's toothed, almost like the tooth of a, your teeth in your mouth. When it has roots down here, but the one side broke off a little bit. So some really fascinating stuff, ancient coral um, up in the hills where I live in the Willow Grove area. You'll find a ton of fossilized corals from about 250 million years ago when this whole area was a shallow ocean and the hills were beaches and beaches have coral reefs and that's the fossilized coral reef. Well, a fascinating, more interesting thing about my collection is most, a ton of the stone tools be it gouges, uh, pressure flaking tools, drill bits, points, spearheads, scrapers, any, you know, toolkit of ancient stone tools, we have found examples of these tools made in a material known as aluminum oxide or corundum. You have a Solutrean style corundum saw blade right here, made out of rough corundum. Now, corundum is aluminum oxide. Um, and corundum ore is where you find sapphires and rubies and um, they're all aluminum oxide. Anything that uh, is aluminum oxide that isn't red or green is called a sapphire. If it's red or green, certain shades of red or green get classified as rubies and emeralds. So um, some of the material, me being, um, my background is in uh, geology, anthropology, and archaeology in college. And I have majored in psychology. Um, so I consider myself an amateur archaeologist with some knowledge, some field training. Um, I'm trained in stole, uh, stone tool design, took some classes in that, a lot of geology labs. And uh, in the area that I live in, um, it's notorious for schist. And schist that contains a lot of metals. And not only is there a ton of schist in this area of Pennsylvania, we're also on one of the oldest fault lines where the Atlantic Fault comes in and pushes underneath of the uh, continental plate, and you get this uptick, um, and you get all these different uh, Miocene nieces and schists and different granites and mesomorphic banding occurring 
where the gooey part of the mantle got caught in between these two plates and pushed up to the surface and kind of accordion together. All this heating, pushing, pressure, and all the aluminum rich ore created a perfect uh, habitat for the growth of emeralds, rubies, and sapphires. And um, that's what was fascinating. A lot of these stone tools, a lot of these stone tools, this is an effigy of a turtle, this is a little tiny turtle, this is yellow sapphire with red banding. You have the side profile of a horse here, it's a pressure flaking tool, pressure on the back. Now corundum is right under the hardness of diamonds, it's about a nine to nine and a half on the most hardness scale. So we can identify them by their hardness mainly. The question is, what fascinating group of people was making all of these crazy stone tools out of the sapphire, clear scraper, sapphire scraper, yellow sapphire, yellow tools. This is like the side profile of a fox or a wolf. This is a willy mammoth. The willy mammoth in bluish, untreated bluish sapphire growing right out of the schist. And what they did is, the schist is the background stone, this green serpentine-like schist in the background here. They seem to have dotted like a cave entrance in the back hill red, like there's a fire burning. And then you've got the eye, the mouth, you can literally see the eye, the nose, the trunk coming up. You see the two dots where the trunk's nose there. And it's roaring from the side um, as it calls out. It's even got a tongue carved in there. And it's almost like um, this is elevated. So it's like a relief. Um, the softer schist was kind of you know, worked down and then they were able to shape the sapphire into this crazy um, side profile of a uh, willy mammoth or um, mastodon of some sort, probably a mammoth or timber mammoth. The reason why this is so significant is because it's a stone tool that at least helps date us a little bit. If um, we say that, hey, this is definitely a willy mammoth, I mean, that is up to speculation. Maybe it was some other image. It's definitely a carved anamorphic pendant or mantle stone of some sort. Now, the thing with the Willy Mammoth is we're talking prior to the extinction of the megafauna, which occurred about 13,000 years ago, in what is thought to be a giant, um, you know, impact event from uh, space, uh, hitting the ice sheets of North America, melting them, instantly flooding the entire continent of North America and destroying everything, essentially um, changing the landscape forever. Uh, and that's what that burn layer is. This stuff was found beneath those burn layers. Uh, it's possible bone fossilized, human, because it's soaked and uh, stained in ochre, just like this red bitumen dye that they would powder, they would cover their bodies in ritualistically in ancient times. Um, but anyways, once I realized a lot of these stone tools and uh, anamorphic pendants and uh, scrapers, um, they're all made out of aluminum oxide. Somebody about 17 to 20,000 years ago, most likely the Salutrians, due to the types of tools that we're finding and the craftsmanship and these real diamond shaped uh, spear points um, with no fluting, which they're very known for. Um, the drill bits, uh, the fine scrapers, the little saw blades, the big, big saw, that's all Salutrian style. And the Salutrians were seal hunters from. Um, what is now Europe? Remember, this is 17, 20,000 years ago, and they weren't even quite genetically exactly like us. They were a hominid cousin of ours that was very similar. But um, this is a theory that even a couple people, scientists from the Smithsonian, have put forward the Salutrian hypothesis that the only people that, you know, the mainstream belief is that it was the Clovis culture came first that everyone that got to North America came across the ice sheet, uh, the Bering ice sheet, or land bridge, um, when it was stalled and able to be crossed. Well, I argue that it would have been a lot easier 17, 20,000 years ago to cross the Atlantic because the ice came all the way down to mid-Pennsylvania. Um, midway through Pennsylvania was where the ice sheet stopped. Everything below that was livable, habit habitable area. Anything above that was under two miles of ice. That ice extended all the way across the ocean over to Europe. You could have walked over here across that ice or just made a small 
vessel out of seal skins, um, a raft of sorts, it's probably a circular raft, put a family on there, and because the ice was bearing down on them, all their food was dying. And oddly enough, what the Salutrians hunted in Europe was the horse. And the crazy thing about this being a horse is it really helps date us because the horse went extinct in North America. It was apparently killed off by early hunters, but I think it was killed off by that great flood that we were just talking about that killed off the other stuff. So, essentially, if they're carving a, a, a picture of a horse, it means that these people were around on this continent and they were dealing with horses that we know went extinct 13,000 years and earlier. So we know that this stuff has to be older. That's another thing that helps date it. But once I realized that they're using corundum to make all kinds of stuff, I realized that corundum has a lot of value, and there must be a ton of rough sapphire and uh, different things in the area. And uh, I was right. So I started sapphire hunting, and all of these are rough corundums. And I've only really been sure about the identification probably for about two years now, and then I've invested some time... Um, in finding more and identifying them and making sure I'm complying with uh, state laws and uh, th places where I find them. Um, make sure you're allowed to search. In alluvial deposits in, in creeks that are tidal, unless there's some kind of mineral right or, um, you know, there's strict uh, provisions against the hobby collecting in a place, then you don't have to worry about it. You're not allowed to dig an underbank. You're not allowed to put the sluices out. You can pan for things recreationally, and you can walk alluvial deposits and find artifacts and gemstones. Now, with the artifacts, just because I collect them does not mean I sell any of them, and I never would, so they're off limits. But I've found a ton of gemstones, and now they've been recently identified. I've got rubies and sapphires and gold sheen sapphires, um... In the Zwadi uh, gold sheen sapphire, I actually found the gold sheen sapphires that I have in my collection. I found this crazy one um, right here. I found this guy about 2010. I found this probably about 2000, eh, maybe 12. So I found this about 2012. And this gold sheen sapphire has even got emerald-ing in it. And on the back you can see um, the different little blue sapphires coming out. Let's see if I can get the light on it. A little bit better for you guys. You can see the blues in there. And you can see all the starring. And this thing's just really incredible. And I didn't know what it was. I thought it was copper ore. And I knew it wasn't co it wasn't magnetic. It wasn't, you know, given any metal readings off at all, even though copper's, you know. Ferris is not magnetic, but um, these gold sheen sapphires, I found another one. This one's still in its corundum barrel-shaped form. I didn't know what these were because when I found these back in 2011, 2012, they weren't even discovered yet. And then they were identified, discovered around then, and they were identified in um, Africa. And I have a huge piece of one back there. And that's called a gold sheen sapphire. Um, and these are all kind of in the ruby category on here, except that's a big yellow sapphire. I'll show you these diamond and rhombus-like matrixes. This is a pad parachetta sapphire back here. It almost looks like golden healing um, uh, quartz. Um, the pad parachetta sapphire is a combination of reds and yellows that give you tangerines and pinks. Like this one is a combination of reds and yellows, and they'll color change. Sapphires have color changing properties um, when different light hits them and more valuable ones can color change. And I'm going to show you an example of why they will. So your most valuable rubies are known as pigeon blood. They'll shift from red to purple in certain lights, um, kind of like these down here. If you crack one of these red rough rubies open, what you'll notice is inside the sapphire is all blue or light blue. And um, really, let me turn the light on real quick. And you can see that it's light blue inside, and it's got that red crusting around the outside. And then when the light, after this is polished, and the light penetrates through, different lights going through red and blue come back purple. Um, makes sense. And then we get some color shifting ones back there as well. But I love this one being 
chopped like this or cracked in half. Um, and nature did that, but it gives you um, this great idea of how that purpley-ish color. You see, it, you see it again here, the blue, the red around the blue, and you get even more massive. Like there's a massive ruby back here. You see the dark red, but you see that blue gem band running through it. And blue sapphire does that a lot. It'll gem band yellow, blue, yellow. If that was in better shape and polished down, you'd get green. Blue and yellow made green. So this is where these color shifting properties come from. Um, you got this beautiful tangerine color, Pad Parachetta, back here. Um, and just all kinds of different sapphires and gemstones. Beautiful Pad Paradasia right there. Um, yellow sapphire, canary yellow. Giant pieces of corundum. This is like a light bluish white corundum. That color shifts from white to light blue. But you can see it kind of grows in these sheets. I have a ton of blue back here. Um, blue sapphire. And it grows out of the schist. And you see the schist here. And then you see the sapphire growing out of it. Here's a beautiful example of super clear sapphire. Pure aluminum oxide is crystal clear. And is extremely valuable. But you see the aluminum rich schist. And in that pocket is all that sapphire growing. Beautiful, clear sapphire. Here's a bet, even better example. You see this really rough schist layer. You're like, oh, nothing's there. Nothing's there. But look at the gem banding of the clear sapphire running through the schist. Look at it right there. See that whole band? There's a pocket of air in between the schist, aluminum rich schist, your crundum ore, got heated up and pressurized and compressed it and cooked it into perfect aluminum oxide, perfect clear sapphire band right there within the, um, the rough corundum ore. Um, and you can see the color really pop. You'll see when the light hits it, you'll see all the blue sapphire in the corundum ore. And this type of blue sapphire here, and you can really see the matrix because it's rough. It's like two different matrix, a bar matrix sapphire, and then the matrix of the corundum, that octagonical matrix in the front kind of got broken off there. This is called a blue sheen. This yellowy, milky color that's running through here gives it different color shifting properties. That's called sheening. And the same thing with, with these gold ones, like uh, that sparkliness, is, that's called sheening. And sheening occurs when, um, during that process, there's a laminate or titanium um, in the uh, schist, which gives you the blue. Uh, and also, you have different materials like hematite, um, rhodidium, um, rhodium, um, different um, sulfurs, things like that. Um, when they interfere with the process of the aluminum oxide forming, they give it these different milky colors and this gold coloration throughout the blue. So remember, crystal clear is pure aluminum oxide. It means no other trace metal, um, you know, got heated up within the schist where it formed. If you get other colors like yellow sapphire, you know that there was hematite and sulfur when it formed. When you get these dark blue uh, sapphires and color shifting sapphires from blue to dark purple, you know that there's titanium, but there's also vanadium and um, vandium within the uh, schist. Um, and my area is full of schist and it's full of geological uh, craziness um, in southeastern Pennsylvania. So we got lots of rubies, blue sapphires, big giant pieces of corundum or sapphires. Um, and just really, really neat discovery. And the other thing I'll go over is, well, how do you test it? Well, it's hardness mainly. When you um, when you have a true sapphire, you can take it on tile, like a tile, and you can scrape the tile all you want. It's never going to leave a mark. It'll take tile with it, though. You see the tile? It's cutting right through the tile because it's harder than porcelain and it's harder than glass. Um, it's about a nine, nine and a half on the Mohs scale. It's right, right next to diamonds. It's uh, one of the hardest substance. Now, oftentimes I see people tell me that I misidentify stuff in comments and things like that. I assure you, my friends, maybe one or two things, because it's a little rough to identify. But most of all, the stuff I've got down, uh, I know the complex, the structure, how it looks, where it's supposed to form, and the fact that we have all of the conditions over time here to let it form, um, we know for sure what it is. And I've got two testers here. 
So I'll explain why. I'm a huge believer in efficacy or, or repeating standards or measurements to make sure that they're accurate. I ordered the name brand one, HMKIS, the Hmkis HMKIS, for about 14, 15 bucks on Amazon. And then I ordered a knockoff one from my, you know, one of my favorite new websites called Timu, which I do have an affiliate link. So if you want to sign up for Timu and save mad money and get awesome things for, for cheap, way cheaper than Amazon, uh, get quick shipping too for free. Um, check out my affiliate link in the description below. Um, if it still allows me to do that. Uh, this is an unfunded channel, so any little bit helps. But this one was only four bucks on Timu. Uh, you can tell it's a knockoff. It's missing the HMKIS, but everything else is identical. Um, I fired, uh, I, I had this one first. I got this one, fired them up, getting the same exact results on all my tests. And real quick, I do have a video up on, on how to use this, and I, I review it. These are really meant for testing small cut gemstones that are already cut. So if you want to tell if you have a fake diamond or not. But really all it is is it, it's a probe that detects hardness, and you have to use it right and correct. And you can test other stuff, and I'll show you how. You got a chart on the back that kind of tells you uh, the temperature, room temperature, uh, where to start at for what carat. We're going to ignore all that stuff. If you're dealing with cut stones, fine. Um, make sure that you have a really good battery. <laughs> Believe it or not, I like the way the knockoff one lights up a little bit better. And it's a little more responsive. I think it's just a fresher battery, but... Um, because I've already tested both of these against one another, I know that I'm good. Um, you want to keep your hand off of this plate, regardless of what any instructions say, because that's actually reading the temperature of the room. Um, and it also gathers the reflection of the heat that comes off of what you're testing. So pretty much uh, it measures the heat reflected back sent out by this probe to, to test the hardness. Um, but uh, it's fairly accurate if you use it correctly, even on bigger stuff. Um, and I'll show you uh, a proper way to test hardness. Um, so the one thing in the area that um, you could get confused for in southeastern Pennsylvania for sapphire or ruby is garnet. And garnet comes in many different colors, almost every color, but more often it's just dark crimson or black, and it'll be in a matrix with schist. This is Wissahick and schist, and these are just a few specimens I pulled out that are garnet complexes. So the black crystals forming and growing out of here, these little guys too. These are garnets, and garnets are a silicate, but they form when uh, there's other metals and heat um, pushed onto the silicates, and it's just as silicate rich. Um, so, you know, it contains different uh, trace amounts of magnesium, different silicates make up garnet, uh, and silicates make up about 90% of the Earth's crust. It's sand, it's quartz, it's feldspar, it's any, anything really that comes from sand or glass is, is a, uh, a silicate. Now, what's neat about this is we know that garnet is supposed to be about a six and a half or seven on the Mohs scale. And we know that rubies, sapphires, um, they're about nine. So where do we start? The first thing you do to get this thing fired up is you gotta turn the toggle and you, you turn it on. Okay, so we'll turn it on real quick. And we wanna get it up to about one, one and a half, and we'll just let it sit. We're going to let it sit. It's gathering the ambient temperature of the room. We're going to let it sit until that second light lights up red, and then we'll be ready to test. And it takes about, I don't know, 30 seconds to a minute. And you can see it's still, it's just lit up right now. So now we're ready to test. And I'll show you what you should do to start this out to for efficacy and accuracy. Take some base readings. I got glass and I got porcelain here. And I usually start at about a three for like normal room temperature. It usually works perfect, three, three and a half. We'll go right there. So I'm gonna test the porcelain real quick. And you see I'm gonna get about a five and a half or a six. And we know that's accurate because we know that's where glass and silicate should be, around five and a half or six. Now here's pure crystal glass here and we're, we're about the same thing five and a half six and a half a little harder we come down to the garnet and we should be about six and a half seven a little higher than glass on the garnet and we're about six and a half seven on that almost eight now we come over to something something much harder like um, a ruby um, 
it, it's gonna it's gonna read a lot harder. Okay, um, so all of these all these rubies here, they're gonna they're gonna read substantially harder, about two to three, you know, whole entire steps harder um, than your glass and your porcelains and your garnets. Garnet, ruby, <laughs> garnet, sapphire. So, um, silicate should read about the same as the garnet, the silicate, a little less hard because it hasn't been crystallized or compressed into that structure. You get a, a, a pad paradasia or ruby or sapphire. I mean, look at the hardness gone through the roof on that. Um, same thing. We got this beautiful tangerine pad paradasia down here. Um, and we're going to be right, if I can get it to sit still. We right up into that same range again. When you do this, you want to make sure it's on a very smooth part of uh, the surface and not like down into a divot. If it slips down into a divot, it's always going to read like 100% hardness. So like, you get on a really soft, flat area like right here, this beautiful yellow and pinkish sapphire. And you can see it go through the roof. But you get it down here on your base readings, you know, and we got it accurate. So I deduce that like a good place to have this set um, at normal room temperature for testing bigger items is between three and a half and four and a half if we bump this down lower it's still going to work it just might not beep on the real hard stuff so if I move it down to one or you know to, to three let's say and I get it on the porcelain again it's still going to go up one or two but if I get it on to a sapphire it's going to go way up But anyways, the HKMI, uh, HKMIS reader, whether you buy the real one or a bootleg one, um, they both worked uh, equally well. Um, I bought two different ones just to test them against each other, just to make sure my results were actually accurate and it was reading the hardness correctly. I also do scratch tests on the porcelain. Um, I don't want to leave marks behind on porcelain or anything. Um, like obviously, this is never going to ever leave any kind of mark on anything like that. It's going to take tile with it. So the only mark you'll see is it actually cutting into the tile. Um, same thing with the porcelain. I mean, um, and silicates uh, are, are hard enough too not to really leave a lot of marks on things. So, because they're about equal hardness, that did leave a mark there. Um, Sometimes we turn this over, it's easier to see marking. Um, but you'll see the silicate rubbing off onto there. You see it? It's softer than the actual tile. Now, if we take a, a, a sapphire or a ruby, I take like this ruby right here and I test it on the back of the tile here in this first square. I can do whatever I want. I can, I can push it as hard as I can now. Never going to leave a red mark. Never going to see any part of the stone rub off onto the porcelain. You're only going to see the porcelain rub off onto the stone. Um, and then we try something softer like a silicate like this. Silicate with the garnets in it. And we see how easily and how soft those silicates rub right off on to the porcelain. So it's a simple test there to show you the differences in, in hardnesses. Um, but anyways, uh, I know my camera work sucks on these videos. Like I said, it's an unfunded thing. It's more mainly to listen to. Uh, if the camera work makes you motion sick, I'm sorry. I have other videos that are more just in picture slideshow format with narration. So maybe select one of those if you don't like the jerky uh, camera work. But um, it's kind of my trading calling card is the Blair Witch style point of view filming. Um, but uh, I hope you like some of the knowledge. Um, please share if you find similar things. 
Um, but look at your geological surveys for your area. Look at uh, the base materials. Look at you know what unique geology is around, and, and see what kind of gemstones could form or grow in your area. And I guarantee you, you'll find some. Um, uh, but um, I don't want to show you uh, how how neat it is, how how accurate this is. Real quick, I'll let me fire it back up because um, a couple of these are gem bandit so we can actually test two different materials at once within the same uh, specimen so let this heat up it takes about a minute um, once it both lights are light up you know just bump it up to about a three um, and I'll show you that within this crazy one that I showed you earlier where you have the schist or the ore, corundum ore, and you see where that crystal clear white sapphire formed um, or pure aluminum oxide formed and grew in between that pocket of the schist. If I test the schist up here, it's going to be kind of hard, but it's still a silicate, slightly harder silicate, six and a half, seven. Pull that off, let it let it come back down to base. Now, if I test the crystal inside, we're gonna we're gonna be up up at least to a nine. So I go silicate six and a half seven, then I switch it over to the white sapphire or the aluminum oxide growing from the schist, and we see the difference in hardnesses. Now, this is like each one of these degrees on a Mo scale is like. Uh, several I think almost like a several thousand times in hardness I'd have to look that up exactly but this is about th four four to five thousand times harder than the base material it's growing out of so we see here you know typical silicate you know six six and a half then we get into the aluminum oxide or corundum and we get a much much harder um, test here now this hasn't been polished or worked this is fresh out of the creek just cleaned um, they're extremely hard to polish. Um, how I polish them, and I've only polished about four or five, everything else is just cleaned up. The first thing I use is Brillo pads to clean soap and water to clean all the dirt. Um, a wire brush sometimes helps, like, uh, got one right here. You can use, like, a palm sander, knock some of the stuff off, and then use a high-powered rotary tool, one that plugs in, has variable speeds, and you absolutely, it's critical that you have a material that's hard enough to actually cut the stone or polish the stone. The stuff that they give you in the kits, these soft, these polyester, these uh, porcelain tip stuff, these will break down within five minutes of trying to polish a sapphire. They'll just you know, blow into different pieces and chunk out. What you really need to do is get diamond, um, diamond Dremel bits, diamond, diamond tipped rotary tools, and um, again, I took a flyer and a chance and ordered these ones off of Timu. And instead of paying about $45 to $50 for a few diamond tip tool bits, I paid about $4 and they were spot on and they work brilliantly. Um, and I also got these diamond files, which are generally used for knife sharpening or cutting down tiles or porcelain. These different diamond files work absolutely great for polishing. So after I rough shape out and, and get the faceting cut back to where it should be, I then smooth it out with these series of different files, this diamond sponge, and then I go to the whetstone to get it really, really shiny. It take hours and hours and hours, and I'm just an amateur at that. The reason why I really uh, started cutting some of them and polishing them is more on the line of experimental archaeology. I wanted to see how these ancient folks were working with this stuff and shaping it because they were not using percussion or um, pressure flaking techniques they were using. Some sort of abrasion and polishing methods like um, to smooth out the shape of the tool that they needed. Um, anyways, I hope you enjoyed, and if you're new to the channel, please subscribe, tell your friends all about Happy Lost Souls, and if you're into uh, finding things and going on adventures, please remember to get lost to find yourself, and stay safe. I love you all. Peace out. Please subscribe, comment, hate it, like it, whatever. But anyways, I hope you gained a little bit of knowledge um, and uh, you enjoyed the video. Anyways, love you all. Peace.